Good afternoon, guys. Dan here from Industry IoT. Um, I hope you're all doing well. Uh, very, very excited um, about today's virtual workshop session with both Jurgen and Murat from Software AG. Welcome, guys. Hello. <laughs> As you can all see, the theme of the session is the new normal, um, digital or insignificant. Um, a very, very topical theme at the moment, and the guys have a fantastic presentation lined up for us this afternoon to speak about some of the work um, that they're doing around transformation, IoT, and analytics. Um, for, you, for those of you that have joined the sessions before, you'll know that um, the initial part of the session will be the presentation, um, followed by an interactive Q&A towards the end of the session. We have 60 minutes allocated. Um, I know the presentation will last around 45 to 50, so we will open up the Q&A as soon as we can towards the end of the session. To ask questions, you'll see at the bottom of your screen there is a Q&A chat room. Um, if you post the questions in there, um, I will do my best to prompt Jürgen and Murat when they come in, and hopefully we can answer as many of them live in the session as possible. Um, if anyone has any questions or any issues throughout, please feel free to message me directly. Um, but apart from that, over to you guys. Thanks, Daniel, and also welcome to this Industry IoT workshop from our side. It's great to have you online with us today. In the next uh, round about 45 minutes, Murad and I will explain to you why the Internet of Things is all about implementing digital business models and how IoT platforms can help you shorten time to market and prove value quickly. You will hear some about some of our customer cases and also see live demos of our software in actions. So that will illustrate that IoT can be used by everyone and not just developers. If we now, before we go into the IoT um, use cases and platform discussion, um, I want to briefly spend some words on, on our company, Software AG. We are data pioneers, founded in 1969, so more than 50 years old. And at that time, um, yeah, we were starting a software business and database and data management, which was quite innovative. You know? And since then, we kept our passion of working with customers to turn data into value. We are an international company, 4,700 employees roughly, more than 10,000 customers in 70 countries, headquartered in Darmstadt in Germany. We're doing roughly 900 million euro revenue and have a very solid financial basis, which is key to fund our strategic growth areas, and IoT is one of them. Now, if we have a look at some of our IoT customers, and you see example logos here, you can see that leading industrial IoT providers and telcos rely on Cumulosity IoT, which is the, the brand of our IoT platform. You can also see that we have a strong customer base in equipment vendors, so that's the smart connected pillars, but that means makers and operators of equipment. In the area of self-service industry analytics, we have a wide footprint and outstanding reputation in process and batch industry with trend miner. And you can also see here that some of our customers are OEMing, that means white labeling our software, whereas others are using it directly for their own purposes. In the direct use cases, companies like, for example, Gartner Denver or Schindler deploy IoT to optimize operations or drive IoT enabled product innovation. That means they are using IoT to build smarter products and higher value services. Through the white labeling, we address value at the resellers and service providers. These companies rebrand our platform in order to launch and sell their own IoT services with their own go-to markets. Good examples here are the telcos, like Deutsche Telekom with their cloud of things, which is a white labeled Cumulosity IoT. Deutsche Telekom certainly adds the managed connectivity and the network, and also they develop apps on top for specific verticals and use cases that depends on their own go-to markets. Telstra, for example, they address utilities and in particular water management in Australia. NTT, they push industrial equipment maintenance solutions and building management and advanced traceability solutions in logistics uh, and push that into the Japanese and wider AP chain markets. KPN in the Netherlands, they are using Cumulosity for container tracking, for construction equipment tracking in real time, even a bicycle insurance use case they have and also waste management solution. And Bosch and A1, they are using Cumulosity for cargo and asset tracking and condition monitoring in railways. Success in our world is not just about technology. It's about establishing a data-centric business strategy. 
And new digital business models are and will be written in software and data is the basis. So software will become the prime source of innovation in every industry, if you like it or not. And the revolution has started. We're living in a connected global world with the proliferation of innovative chipsets, sensors, wireless and mobile networking technologies like low power one, 5G, cloud and edge computing, and the convergency of OT and IT, a plethora of new use cases and consequently business opportunities is arising. Only those companies that implement a digital strategy will survive as these will be able to innovate and differentiate themselves through software. So due to a software-based or at least software-enhanced business model, they will be able to adapt fast enough to new technology trends and market requirements. For example, a 5G-based factory network or applying AI for anomaly detection in their production. IoT, as you know, is booming and has a huge market potential. Analysts predict 75 billion connected devices by 2025 and 60 trillion investment in industrial IoT over the next 15 years with a CAGR of around 29% of the global IoT market. And these billions of devices generate vast amounts of data. You know? And we all know the value is in the data. So you need software, that means algorithms, to turn that data into value and be able to offer smarter products and higher value services to your customers. At Software AG, we call this vision the truly connected enterprise with its ubiquitous connectivity, heterogeneous data sources and immense data volumes. And there we see two main drivers. Number one, the connected customer experience. And number two, everything as a service. And nowadays, the greatest increase in product and service innovation are created from a superior customer experience. You know, these companies that have the best customer experience normally win. And furthermore, the consumerization is driving more customers to prioritize the use of a capability or assets over its ownership. And from that, the truly connected enterprise results and considers everything as a service as the default business model for all new products and services. And this is becoming the new reality. Let's now have a look at the connected customer experience. You all know Tesla, Elon Musk's company producing electrical cars. Here you can see a request from a customer, Paul Franks, via a social media channel. He said, hey, can you guys program the car once in park to move back the seat and raise the steering wheel? And you can see Elon's reply. He say, oh, good point. We'll add that to all cars in one of the upcoming software releases. Do you realize how different this is to the typical way our automotive companies are used to work? and build and improve cars, where it can take years from design to production and release of a car. And here you see what happened at Tesla. The requested feature was delivered only four months later through a software update to all Tesla cars. There is no need to schedule a separate appointment with the car dealer or a garage to make this change. Customers simply woke up in the morning with a smarter, safer, and more intuitive car, thanks to software. So this is a great example for superior connected customer experience. And connected enterprises create connected products with such an outstanding customer experience. This is leading to disruptive innovation and extreme differentiation. The disruption here refers to a significantly shorter innovation cycle. You have four months instead of four years. And Tesla, due to that, Tesla is able to bring new innovations in the form of software features much faster to the market and also easier to the market and thus is, is more competitive and can grow revenues quicker. For example, they have other features. A software update for increased acceleration costs 2,000 US dollars or autonomous driving costs 8K US dollars, right? But it's a subscription-based business where you can then upsell new features easily. So Tesla is a great example that shows how to leverage the power of software and connectivity, these cars are connected, you know, to disrupt the traditional car business. I also want to give you an example from our IoT customer base. Dürr is a leading global machine and plant manufacturer with a high level of automation expertise. The app, it's a difficult name, DXQ Equipment Analytics, that's the name Dürr choose. Um, this app is used for online quality control during the painting of cars. Yeah? Algorithms analyze the incoming data, such as a paint flow from the painting process in real time and detect anomalies. This enables the operator to react immediately, thus preventing further car bodies from being painted incorrectly. The algorithms can be easily created by means of a graphical user interface without any programming knowledge. 
you'll see a live demo later in the session. So software enables the machine operator to, um, to update the analysis and, and to take new patterns into account. Just to give you some insights into the complexity, we have in this use case, 230 available signals per robot, two gigabytes of data per robot per day. And this gives you endless opportunities for process monitoring. So the app includes both current software technologies based on our IoT platform, Cumulosity, and also Dure special expertise in the painting process. Yeah? And this combination is how Dure is offering efficient solutions for smart networking of the painting process. And this is a digital innovation. With such a digital innovation, Dure is turning paint shops into smart factories. And this is giving them the utility and innovation similar to the Tesla case. Now let's turn towards another shift that we are observing in the market, namely everything as a service. Customers prefer consuming a service over owning an asset. For example, Lexmark, a company producing copiers and printers that all know, is transforming their business towards selling printing as a service rather than selling a printer to their customers. Another example is shown here on this slide, Gartner Denver. They are a leading global provider of high quality industrial equipment um, like compressors, blowers, pumps, fueling systems, and so on. And rather than selling or renting the industrial equipment, they want to offer it as a service to their customers. For example, compressed air as a service. Gartner Denver's customers rely on the continuous operation of their industrial equipment, whether they be blowers, compressors, or pumps. In order to get there, they needed to connect the equipment to a cloud-based IoT platform, in this case, Cumulosity, and monitor its use remotely. With our platform, Gartner Denver were able to successfully launch an IoT-powered condition monitoring service to their global customers through their multitude of distribution and service partners. You know, with a very short time to market of only six weeks, because it was a, they were able with our software to do the branding and customization only by configuration, no coding was required. Furthermore, they used new insights into the usage of the connected assets to reduce the equipment downtimes, improve the part replacement and also repair cycles. But everything as a service also comes with some implications. Number one, your business model needs to be a subscription or usage-based one. You know? In the past, almost all companies prefer to receive full payment for products upfront. But now things are changing. You know? If you want to sell a machine along with some software, this is normally getting more expensive. Um, and, and customers are risk averse, right? So now OEMs need to design this usage-based pricing and measuring and billing into their products. And this usage-based financing and manufacturing has the potential to allow end users to purchase more expensive machines with software while reducing their risk on a new technology. So there's also a transfer of risk going on. And another important point, if you offer your product as a service, you need to have a superior service excellence to win and retain your customers. In a subscription-based business, it's much easier for the customers to stop using your connected products and software and turn over to competitor. So you need to continuously ensure that your machines and assets are running smoothly. Remember the Gartner Denver case. And for that reason, you need remote management and monitoring capabilities that allow you to perform software and firmware updates easily over the air, continuously analyze the usage of your devices, detect fixes and anomalies quickly, ideally proactively before your customer's production is affected and engage in a much more transparent and direct way with your customers. Being a subscription business means that you land with a small IoT solution and then expand step by step in adding new use cases and additional value through new apps and software enhancements, like in the Tesla example, over time. A superior connected customer experience and the shift towards everything as a service are leading to a truly connected enterprise. And this is the new reality you're confronted with in your business. And this truly connected enterprise touches nearly all areas of your existing enterprise. You need to transform your enterprise to make it ready for the new connected digital world. This starts with software to connect and manage devices, goes towards gathering, managing, and analyzing the data, integrating the new IoT device and data with your existing IT landscape, updating you go to market and sales towards selling products as a service, turning to subscription business with recurring revenues, 
over providing the right customer experience and services with your new offerings to your customers. And all this requires an everything as a service and digital mindset from your people. In order to master the challenges of a truly connected world, you need to be prepared to deal with the fast adoption of cloud-based applications. Many of them aim at bringing operational efficiencies into your enterprise. They are likely to pop up everywhere in your company. They might have been introduced without any governance from IT, but for pure business and fast time to market reasons. The end-to-end -end integration of applications, devices, clouds, and data will be key in order to drive operational excellence and superior customer experience. In 80% of the IoT projects, 50% of the budget is usually spent on integration. And finally, innovation will be increasingly based on platforms and openness and flexibility of such platforms are key criteria to be successful in the future. Now let's compare the approaches of number one, building a custom IoT solution from scratch with using an IoT platform as a basis. This slide illustrates that IoT is complex and you have to deal with a heterogeneity of different devices, protocols, connectivity options, security decisions, data and device management requirements. Which combination to select depends on your specific IoT use case. It can also happen that you start with one approach and you might need to move to another one later because you need a much better scalability in your IoT use case, like a mass deployment, or you have to incorporate new hardware, new networking technologies like 5G, or new software trends like deep learning, for example. Keeping your teams busy with understanding, evaluating, and implementing such base functionality doesn't help your business. Your customers will only recognize the added value that you deliver in your apps along with your connected products, the things on the top. Yeah? Your customers will only recognize, I'm sorry, this value doesn't come from the connectivity or device management per se, but from the analytics that you apply on your IoT data, the higher value data, insights and actions that you derive. For example, a better animal detection that you add into your software parts or a predictive maintenance um, feature that you add in your software or an integration into end-to-end -end manufacturing processes on a better level of automation. Yeah, this really matters. And also the user experience that you provide in your IoT application and the ease of use of your overall IoT solution. So the things on top of the iceberg, that's what matters. So you should focus um, yourself on leveraging your domain expertise and core competences to drive innovation and differentiation by building IoT applications and solutions on top of a feature-rich IoT framework, as this will give you competitive advantage and accelerate your business. The layers under the water here in the, in the chart, like the connectivity and device management, this will become a commodity and will be offered by leading IoT platform vendors out of the box. And you should rather consider them as building blocks which accelerate the development of your IoT apps. Besides the different protocols, APIs, connectivity options, there are many other things to, to, to look at. How you store data, yeah? There is data that needs to be stored for shorter timeframes, longer timeframes, sometimes years. There are different ways to store the data, structured ways, in, in, in non-structured and unstructured ways. Uh, like in document stores, in data lakes, if you want cost-efficient long-term storage. There are also different flavors of analytics that you need there. Yeah? Some data needs to be analyzed in real time. Other data can be stored and analyzed after the fact. Sensors and IoT devices generate time series data, so you also need to be able to look for anomalies and be able to visualize and explore time series uh, data. And you want to apply machine learning over stored data, but then do the real-time storing in, in, in real time, yeah, the scoring of the models in real time. Uh, you want to visualize the data in dashboards and finally then integrate it with contextual data that sits in your IT systems, in other cloud services, like a, like a, like a maintenance um, or field service in the cloud. Um, you have your ERP system that need to be integrated. So there are a lot of things to be done and, and considered or you want to expose um, APIs to your customers and partners or share data with them. This is where API portal and management comes into play. And even you can monetize the access to that data through an API portal. Yeah? Then you have to take security into consideration uh, from the beginning, from the connectivity options over the data encryption, secure data storage, data segregation, if you think about multi-tenancy, 
authentication, authorization, and, 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 and. You know, there are many, many flavors. So it's important that you build um, on top of an open and extensible architecture. Ideally, and we can see this in our customer base quite a lot, um, you should establish a multi-vendor, multi-cloud strategy so that you can ensure flexibility and agility. For example, we have customers that run our platform on AWS, on Azure, and Alibaba, you know, and who combine our offering with platform services from the hyperscalers. You know? So they, they use our software and store the data in Azure Data Lake or in S3, or they connect the Power BI um, to Cumulosity. Yeah, we don't provide these components because it doesn't make sense. They are there on the hyperscaler stacks and they do this very well. So we provide the integration and that's why a multi-vendor, multi-cloud strategy is so powerful. Yeah? So we have these pre-built technical integrations supporting multi-vendor architectures. And some customers want to run their IoT apps, for example, in Europe and Asia and in China and Alibaba. And they don't want to re-implement them because the underlying, um, the underlying technology stack changed. Now let me summarize the benefits, the key benefits of buying an IoT platform over building custom IoT solutions. First, you can focus on your innovation and differentiation and build on top of proven base functionality. Also, don't underestimate the implementation of enterprise-grade features like multi-tenancy, high availability, scalability, and security. This is nothing you can easily add to custom IoT solution at the later point in time. When building a custom solution, it takes on average much longer to build and realize return on investment than to buy a ready-to-go platform, where you can get it up and running in a matter of days, not months or years. If different departments in your organization implement their IoT use case on the same platform, the ROI can be reached even faster. And we see many customers um, that have, have shown this and enjoyed also our easy pay as you grow pricing, such as Lyrico, Trekarando, or STW. As IoT platforms are designed to support a wide variety of use cases, you can adopt faster to new customer and market requirements and can thus much easier keep up with the heterogeneity in devices, protocols, standards, and tools. And lastly, the development and operation gets simplified as you can build on top of a proven, highly availability and fully supported and maintained platform that's upgraded regularly and further developed and even offered as a managed service with LSLAs to go, if you like. A usage-based pricing further reduces investment risks on your end. So together, this results in a better TCO. Cumulosity IoT is our horizontal IoT platform that can be used to implement IoT use cases across the verticals um, and it has a built-in carrier-grade security and scalability concept. It provides you with modular capabilities in different layers. You know, the first layer is about device connectivity and device management, which allows you to connect devices across different networks and protocols. Today, we have a plug-and-play integration with more than 150 devices and gateways and support more than 300 protocols. You can remotely manage, monitor, and access the devices and perform device operations, such as firmware and software updates. The second layer is about data storage, visualization, and various disciplines of analytics, including streaming analytics for real-time analysis, time series analytics, and machine learning. The third layer deals with integration of enterprise applications, cloud services, backend systems in IT and OT and API management. This is very important because often you need to combine device data with data from your enterprise applications. The fourth layer is about application enablement, giving the developers the freedom to add any missing functionality to the platform in the form of microservices that are deployed and hosted within the platform, inheriting the scaling, security, high availability, and monitoring concepts from Cumulosity. While the microservice SDK and hosting address the backend, it complements our existing web SDK and plugin hosting aimed at extending the front end. And finally, the topmost fifth layer provides you with solution accelerators. That means prepackaged applications that help you get started quicker when building your IoT solutions. And due to a modular design, you can get started quickly with just a few capabilities and then can leverage additional ones as your IoT solution requirements grow over time. So you can start small and prove value quickly. Furthermore, Cumulosity IoT can be fully wide labeled, as I mentioned initially. We provide true multi-level, multi-tenancy support um, which is important for our wide labeling customers like Deutsche Telekom or Siemens or Adamos. And also very interesting to note here is 
Um, the platform is a cloud platform, it's designed cloud first, but also runs on the edge and on-prem if needed. And we fully support distributed architecture, so combinations of edge and cloud. And on the multi-tenancy side, we have tenant hierarchies. That means we also allow um, to have sub-tenants. And that's very important if you um, are up to a B2B2X business model. Yeah? And if you look at these white labeling partners, this is exactly what they do. Adamos, they are white labeling this. So the machine builders like Dürer or DMG Mori build their apps and sell this to their customers. That means BMW or Daimler or VW, which are then the customers, so the sub-tenants. Leading analysts like Gartner and Forrester rank Software AG as a leader in key IoT domains, such as industrial IT platforms in the middle, real-time analytics on the left-hand side, and hybrid integration on the right-hand side. Let's now have a look at how we make our IoT platform accessible for everyone. That means not only the developers, but also the line of business. That means the subject matter experts. We call this democratizing IoT. Our vision is to make IoT solution building as easy and as fast as possible. With self-service tooling, we want to enable the masses to access and analyze IoT data, and not only the developers and data scientists. We also want to empower the line of business to implement a data-driven business strategy. In other words, we want to enable the guys that you can see in the background, the machine operators, the process engineers, the plant managers, to gain benefits in IoT use cases by leveraging our rich self-service tooling. The example is again from Dürr um, here, yeah? And this is the anomaly detection that's running at the automotive paint shops, actually at the edge on an industry PC. And this is in production at BMW, VW, Mercedes, and so on. And with democratizing IoT, we, we see three layers there. The first one is democratization of data. So provide access to the data. And there we have tools like a cloud field bus in Cumulosity that supports protocols like OPC UA, Modbus, Canvas, and it's purely configuration driven, no coding. And then with integration, we provide easy connectivity to, to cloud services. You'll see that in the demo. The second layer is democratization of analytics. There we have, for example, smart rules, which is a wizard driven UI to define geofences or thresholds. It helps you a lot to do condition monitoring, for example. And Trendminer, which is self-service industry analytics. And finally, we have the democratization of apps. So we have a cockpit to build dashboards. We have a self-service device management with a cloud remote access in there. And also the solution accelerators, which, which make it easy to, to deal and configure, uh, to, to deal with apps and configure the apps. So there is no need for coding in order to get started with your IIoT projects. Most of the job can be done with our self-service tooling through configuration. And this is different to the hyperscalers who primarily target developers. There, developers need to select and wire many platform services together in a development project in order to build the first IoT application. This consumes time, the right knowledge of the hyperscaler stacks, and also a sizable developer team. We consider it to be important to take a company-wide approach and might make IoT accessible to the masses. In many cases, the business lines are the decision makers for investment. And there, the democratization of IoT is key to drive adoption and success. And now let me hand over to Murad. He will show you Cumulosity IoT and this self-service tooling in action. Thank you very much, Jürgen. So I'm going to, to share my screen and as already mentioned by Jürgen, I'm going to show you a little bit of the functionalities of the Cumulosity. Um, of course, not all of them uh, in, in a matter of time. So what you, what you actually see here on my screen is the standard appearance of the Cumulosity. And what you actually don't see, uh, as Jürgen already mentioned, is you don't see where it's up and running. So this is a cloud instance that is running on AWS in Frankfurt, but this could also be an on-premises installation that is running on your plant, on your factory, but also on, on the machinery itself. You wouldn't see it from a functionality point of view. So we use the same code bases and um, wherever it's, it's running independent on the deployment model, the functionalities are all the same. Second thing is um, the white labeling. We talked about that. Like many customers, uh, a lot in the industrial sector require white labeling because they do have something, yeah, we call a trust relation to the end customers. So the platform itself is fully white labeled. All the applications we do have here, um, you, know, you can upload own applications uh, on here 
um, since we use uh, the REST API as a communication channel, so you can create own web UIs as you want. So this is the standardized UI, as I showed you. Um, Adamos, for example, uses a UI that, okay, I mean, you can guess it, it's, it looks a little bit like Cumulosity, but for example, when you go to DMG Mori, there's yeah, actually no Cumulosity from a, a UI perspective involved anymore. So what you can do uh, with the benefit, and I mean, this is what, what Deutsche Telekom or Siemens Mantra are doing, they, they rely on backend functionalities that are there without building them from the scratch and just create a UI that makes their end customers familiar with what they are using. So let's, <clears throat> let's go to the, the use case that was already mentioned by Pure. Um, Pure you create spray robots and um, these spray robots are yeah, delivered to, uh, yeah, I guess all the famous uh, German car manufacturers. Uh, you see that here in the visualization as cars, but just imagine it would be cars. Uh, you see it here as bikes, but just imagine it would be cars. So the idea was there that they want to yeah, supervise and condition monitor, but also react on the quality process of the painting process in real time. So what they have up and running is an edge installation of the Cumulosity IoT platform embedded in their Vue application that is supervising the process of painting and giving the quality process people, yeah, notifications and alerts. But just to make sure uh, what, you have, what you have here is uh, the, the cockpit. So um, how, do, how do the process people make sure that they get the overview about their plant or their factory site or the machine? I mean, this is basically what um, a user will see at the, at the very first or have it big in the plants. So what we have in the application here, our cockpit, um, is something where you can track and drop widgets. So the idea is here that from a, yeah, a large amount actually of widgets, you can, yeah, choose a widget such as, for example, a data point graph. Do you then, I don't know, add some kind of data points, for example, the actual pressure or the set pressure. You give it a certain color, you aggregate it over a certain time, and then you just place this on your cockpit or your, your desktop, whatever. And then um, this is actually ready to use as a real-time monitoring dashboard. Uh, you can use and you can supervise. And I mean, yeah, I don't know, like an 80-20 approach. Like for 80% of the use cases, the widgets we do have here pre-built are uh, sufficient and very good to use. But we also do have a widget SDK where you cre can create like very fancy um, uh, widgets. So you can use SCADA visualizations as this bike, bike thing here is to drag and drop those on your dashboard. Now the process and quality people, I'm, I mean, they have better things to do than just looking on the screen all the day. So what they actually want is they want to get notified if the process is not, not running as expected. So they want to get alarms, notifications. Um, and just to make sure that we talk about this, the same thing when I talk about streaming analytics right now, I just place here on a little dashboard uh, visualization on a time scala. On a time scala, you have like certain time intervals like past, present, and future. And we do have historical data. This is data that is yeah, stored in a database, in a table. This could be something that is written on paper, actually. Um, and you would answer questions like, what was the average temperature last week? If you go on the other side of this time scala, then it would be questions like, what would be the temperature tomorrow or next week? So prediction. When I talk about streaming analytics, then it's about the now. What is happening right now on the machine side? So in continuous flow of information, uh, or an event stream, so data in motion that is analyzed and needs to be, yeah, um, supervised, needs to be decided whether with this event, with this information should be something done. And this happens with our streaming analytics engine that is called APAMA. So APAMA runs in the background and is analyzing all the events that goes into the platform. And they have various methods on how to deploy rules. So whether the engine should do something. And I want to show you two today that are very easy to use. So the first one is called smart rules. And smart rules is something, yeah, this is for people that can, yeah, they can work with a web browser um, or they can like really think in an easy way as a, if this happens, then do that. Like 
recipes, templates, something that is very easy to configure because we have menus in the UI here that are pre-configured. So for example, if I do have an alarm on the platform that was raised by the machine, for example, then please send me an email. So what we do have in here in this template is uh, we just enter the email of John Doe here um, and then we, we create that rule. And now in the streaming analytics engine, the engine watches for every alarms and then sending an email to John Doe. There are also other rules, like for example, in watching geofences, if there are geolocal uh, coordinates involved, but also if there are measurements missing. So if the machine is probably not sending correct data anymore, but also if a certain threshold is missing. So very easy to use, but what you also see is it of course has its limitations, right? So you cannot, at a certain point, you will yeah, get out of this template limit. And for that, we uh, actually released the Apama Analytics Builder. When you think back on the quality observer, the quality process guy on uh, the factory side of BMW that is checking the, yeah, the color quality of the cars, then he has a very strong domain expertise. He can tell you in words what he wants to look at. He can say stuff like, I check the pressure and over time, over 10 seconds, I don't know. He can say that in words, but he cannot code. So, um, in the past, you had to like tell that people and then other people started coding that, et cetera. So there was a lot of time involved in order to yeah, create those rules. With the Apama Analytics Builder, you have function blocks. So function blocks that by name actually tell you what it's doing, right? So let's go through that. We have a function block that is a measurement input. So it says all the inputs that are the actual pressure and all the inputs that are the set pressure should go into the difference block. And I mean, by the name, you can already tell what this block is doing, right? It's calculating the difference. And then you integrate that over a certain time. And if this integral exceeds a certain threshold, then please create an alarm. So just by wording and not coding, you created a very powerful um, streaming analytics rule that is running now sharp in the background. And if we go back now to our dashboard, we can just easily um, create a widget or a place and drop a widget that is an alarm list, for example, where, um, where we say, okay, all the alarms that are still active and not cleared, I want to see them on the dashboard. And then you, you drop that there and uh, I don't know, you monitor it somewhere on the screen in the factory, for example. That was streaming analytics. If we go to the historical data, then, I mean, since there's a lot of data coming into the platform, so all sensor data, machinery data, um, that needs to be somewhere stored to, to, uh, to uh, allow analytics on a later stage. So for that, we do have the application of the data hub. So the data hub has actually two, two main tasks or topics on what to do. The first one, and it, takes, it takes care for the offloading. So, um, all the data that comes into the platform is then moved or offloaded to a data lake. So this could be a S3 bucket, uh, Azure data lake, or even the local file system. So a very cheap method to store data over a long term. Um, I don't know, for 10 or 15 years, for example. So, oh, I'm sorry. Um, but it also has a second topic. And the second topic is we don't, or we, we don't want to force business people or data scientists people to use certain tools. They are familiar with their tools. They know their Power BI's, their Tableau's, their clicks. They know their Python's or R's. They want to use that. So, and they can still use that. But the only thing is they now, instead of connect to various databases and tables, they connect to the data hub and just use standard SQL queries to ask the data hub for the data and get those then via standard connectors like ODBC or JDBC. So just to show that in a, just a brief connection here, what you can do is you can uh, configure um, collections here. So I can say, please offload all the events in the platform or all measurements of a certain time. And uh, then I configure that. And in the background, it's scheduled uh, doing that every hour, for example. And then the data hub takes care for shifting all the data from my platform to the data lake I configured prior. And the same is then true if I want to, to query that. So right here I created a little Power BI dashboard. Um, so for example, if I connect it to the data lake, then I can now do stuff like, yeah, 
create some KPI dashboards. What's the, I don't know, mean pressure, for example, but also how does the pressure uh, evolve over time or over days or uh, whatever. Um, so very easy to use. The people on business or data science side can still use what they want to do. We already had it that the, the platform itself is not a business case, right? So your customers or the end customers wouldn't pay because you say you have a platform. So they, they, look, they, they are looking for a value. They are looking for something that makes their life easier. They make their life more efficient, their plant more efficient. Um, so the idea of microservices here, so all the applications here are microservices. And since this is where you can add your value, I want to show you how you can make those available to your customers. So the subtenant concept, where is it? It's here. The subtenant concept um, of the cumulosity allows. I just enter here for uh, example customers. So let's let's say for example, Loon Fertiger Miller says, oh, this Apama analytics build is very good. Uh, I want to have that. And I'm willing to pay for that because I can create my own rules. So the idea is now uh, that, um, you that uh, you, you, you belong to the platform uh, has this application and uh, only with a click because this is an available application on your platform, you can just make it available to the customer, Müller in this case, and just subscribe it to the customer. This was a UI click in here. This could also be a REST API call in the background. And uh, now Mr. Miller is ready to use the Apama Analytics Builder and yeah, has a value application he's willing to pay for. From our experience, we actually know that most of the use cases, they don't stop on the shop floor level, right? And we already discussed the integration part. So um, in all real world examples, there are various third party tools, databases or system that somehow needs to be integrated to make the use case uh, more smooth or make it even wider or better. So integration is actually the key. So what I want to show you here is our integration tool that is called Web Methods. Um, we do have that also in various uh, deployment versions. So this is webmethods.io, so the cloud, cloud version here uh, with a lot of cloud connectors. Uh, this also exists as, uh, as on-premises versions where, where you can do connections um, on, on a plant site, for example. But the idea is here to work with connectors to various systems. So there, there are quite a lot of them. And let's go back to the deer case, so make it a little bit more concrete. So we have the case that the a Palma Analytics Builder is analyzing the, the continuous stream and finds out there, yeah, there's an error. There needs to be done something on the robot itself. Uh, but maybe this is out of the re reach of the plant, but needs to involve Dur, for example. So a service, service technician is, for example, needed. So what I can do here in the flow is I can say, I want to have the trigger of cumulosity. And where, whenever there is an alarm that is a certain criticality or has a certain ID or whatever, then please start this workflow. So now this is running in the background and whenever there's a cumulosity alarm, this workflow gets triggered. And now it's, for example, checking Jira, whether there's an open issue or an open ticket. And if not, it's creating one. And then it's checking, okay, what was the robot doing prior to the error? So um, was there already some information or warnings that were probably ignored, for example? And then it's checking who's responsible on the side of the factory. So who should I call or who's, who's our guy there? And then it's, I don't know, checking, for example, uh, do, when was the last maintenance appointment? And they're sending a mail maybe to the customer. So uh, we got an error there. Uh, we are aware of that and we are internally checking. The service guy is uh, calling you any minute. And what we could also do now is, uh, for example, check for, for some spare parts in our store. Uh, that could be sent directly to the customer. Yeah, order or connect a SAP via a C4C connector and implement it already with a ERP um, ticket or information or whatever. So what you see again, self-service, right? No coding involved. I can just create connections uh, via wire and connectors and create very powerful and, um, and good workflows that brings value to uh, your end customers. So this was a very, and I'm very good in time actually. So this is a, this was a very brief uh, overview about uh, uh, functionalities of the platform. So um, 
I'm very happy to, to assist you in any further questions. So uh, there's the possibility to, to open trial accounts for everything I just showed here. So Cumulosity or web methods. So to feel, feel free to do that on the software AG uh, cloud page. And uh, I'm happy to assist afterwards if there are any technical questions. So back to you, Jürgen. Yeah, thank you, Murat. Let me share my screen again. And um, IoT is a journey for all of us. Yeah, you, you know that. And we see a variety of IoT use cases and projects out there in the market. But the early days where people really wanted to find out whether there is some value for them in this IoT hype are over. It's understood by most enterprises that such value exists. And the use cases can be basically classified into two categories. Number one, it's about efficiency and optimizations based on connected products. And number two is really about launching entirely new business models, right? And our advice here or recommendation is really first to think big. So establish your IoT initiative as part of your company's digital transformation strategy and take a company-wide approach, ideally. Yeah? But then start small. Start with a clear business case and prove value quickly. And you can see here the, the cases that we see most often where, where customers start is really about remote management, remote monitoring, condition monitoring. Yeah, connect your, your pump or, or whatever you have, your compressor or wind turbine to a cloud platform. That's a big, big step forward for many companies in their digital transformation. Remotely access and manage the devices. And um, that's, that's really where, where most customers start. And then move fast, yeah? Do the integration as Murat showed, yeah? The example here is from Lurico where we connect the coffee machines and integrate that with an SAP system because knowing that you run out of capsules is nice, <laughs> but ordering new capsules upfront and ensuring that you always have enough cappuccino capsules when needed, that's perfect, right? And then do more and more step-by-step, step, yeah? Add more analytics, add streaming analytics, add machine learning, and finally come to these absolutely new business models like a pay-as-you-go car insurance, yeah? Um, You'll get there, but, but don't try to turn the back wheel in the beginning. Do it step by step. Um, and then don't go alone and try, don't try to reinvent the wheel. The example I want to give here is Adamos. Adamos is a, is a joint venture of, of six machine builders, um, big ones like DMG Mori, Dirt, Zeiss, um, ASM. And also software AG, as you can guess, we're not a machine builder, so we're the software guys in there. So we bring in the software and platform expertise and the machine builders bring in their domain expertise. And Adamos has grown nicely. Recently, even PwC joined as a, as a shareholder in Adamos. Now they have more than 25 machine builders in that, in that ecosystem and also enabling partners. That means consulting companies, implementation partners, and research partners. And they exchange ideas and best practices. Yeah? They even offer digital transformation services to help new machine builders getting started quicker with IoT use cases. So don't go along. Establish strong partnerships and or join a suitable existing IoT ecosystem. Because an IoT solution has many different pieces. It's the devices, the network, the IoT platform, and the software stack, the apps on top, yeah? And all this needs to be developed, operated, and hosted, and marketed, yeah? So you can't do everything end-to-end -end on your own. So let me summarize the key takeaways from this webinar. Um, our vision is around the truly connected enterprise, driving a new generation of digitization. Flexible integration to IT systems, OT systems, as well as devices across cloud, edge, and on-prem is essential to innovate and win in this emerging market. Don't underestimate the heterogeneity in IoT projects. You saw this, different types of analytics, protocols, networks, all that stuff. With the tight integration of our hybrid integration API management into our IoT platform, and you saw that live from Murad, Software AG is uniquely positioned in the market to be a trusted and experienced co-innovation partner for you on your IoT journey. Build on top of an open and mature IoT platform, which allows you to focus on your core competences and thus drive innovation and differentiation forward with shorter time to market for your IoT solutions. And we co-innovate with our customers and partners on their digital transformation journey. From a company size perspective, we are small and agile enough to care and listen to your requirements but we're also big enough to matter and deliver according to our promises and roadmap. And with our open and independent approach, you can implement multi-cloud, multi-vendor architectures. 
And together that forms a powerful foundation for a truly connected enterprise. And now let's open up the line for questions and answers. Thank you very much, um, Jürgen and Murat. Very, very interesting presentation. Murat, thank you for the live demo. Um, it, was, it was great to see it working um, in person live in the session, um, which is superb. Um, we do have a few questions already waiting for you guys. So people were posting them um, as you were speaking. Um, I'm not sure, um, Jürgen, maybe um, yep. can you see the Q&A chat room? You should see some notifications in there uh, um, with a little build up of questions. Maybe it's just easier for you to um, read them and answer them. Uh, I'm struggling at the moment. Give me a second. Even okay, I can, I, I, can, I can read you out the first couple while you find it. So we have a <laughs> yeah. question that says, um, what is Software oh, yeah. Age's contribution to the connected customer experience? Mm -hmm. And do you also have subscription and billing tools? Uh, yeah, we do, the, we do have the subscription management as part of the platform. Murad showed parts of that, and we also do the metering underneath. Um, we don't provide a billing component out of the box today. We're currently looking into that. Um, that's part of our, our um, yeah, roadmap going forward you know, to also look at how we can offer a marketplace on top um, to make that accessible. Aramos, for example, they have um, um, an Aramos store concept on top. So what we see that these white labeling partners often have the billing component on their side, but the subscription management is needed. And that's why it's part of our platform. Good. The next question on the list, um, Jürgen, is um, please share your governance documents. I am especially interested in ethical practices, identifying and acting on a bad players and unintended negative consequences. Um, I'm not sure whether that's a, a question as such, but maybe if you have something to contribute to that. Yeah, I would, I would have a question actually with regard to that one, uh, whether this is more a security related question. So let's say a security best practices, how we allow devices to connect and, and users to interact with the platform and how we plug, for example, denial of service attacks or, or misbehaving devices. Um, or we have this microservices concept, right? So you could have the idea to inject malicious code into the platform. So we have... Um, guidelines and security concepts around that or is the question refers to something totally different more on the on the on the people side and and and, and yeah best practices side yeah. yeah okay jerry if um if you're still live in the session if you could perhaps come back to us on that that would be great um the next question i'm not sure whether you can see this one jürgen i think yeah. it <laughs> refers to maybe some of your your products more specifically when Trend Miner will be integrated, yeah, um, I, I can see the questions now on my second okay. screen here. That's great. Um, Trend Miner is already uh, integrated. We have a beta version of it, so it's not fully released, but uh, we have an integration so we can get the, um, the time series data, which is technically stored in a, in a MongoDB, which is the operational database in Cumulosity, into Trend Miner. And you can then use their self service um, analytics and, and anomaly detection mechanisms in there. To, uh, to analyze your cumulosity data. You know? um, and we are also looking into, they are big, as you said here in the question, they are big in the chemical and, and, and pharma industry. Um, and we're now, but the tool is generic. It's a time series analytics tool, right? So it can be applied to other use cases as well. There are some enhancements that we have to do um, to trend mana, for example, the time series resolution, because take the Dura example, yeah? some of these patterns appear in a sub-second window, whereas in the chemical industry, um, you don't need to look for patterns in a sub-second window. So we'll have to make some enhancement to the product to make it also fit for discrete uh, manufacturing. But that's work in progress. And if you're interested, Mohamed, please be free to reach out to us. We're currently doing um, beta versions and, and um, pre-releases with selected customers. The next one um, to, uh, is related to app development. Uh, what solution does SAG provide in the area of low code development? Um, is there any integration with the Mendix? No, there is no integration with Mendix today. We would use our um, integration capabilities that Murad showed, so Web Methods IO and also the API um, portal and management to, to build such an integration with external low code development tools. Out of the box, um, we don't provide an app building environment besides our 
besides our cockpit application and the um, yeah the integration to an API tooling that you well, you haven't seen the API tooling, but besides the integration API tooling that we have. Um, the next question: We collect lots of data, but sometimes struggle to pull it all together and aid in decision making. Where is a good place to start? I think absolutely valid first to collect the data. I assume it's it's in some kind of database or or um, or data lake, yeah. And then normally you would like to apply some some machine learning it, for example, to it, yeah. Um, but even even these data scientists that, that know how to use all these machine learning algorithms like support vector machines or deep neural networks, um, they like to have a visualization first. And and Trend Miner can really be a cool tool to look into because this data normally is time series data. Yeah, to get a feeling for the data, how the data looks over time. Yeah, to see the trends visually, and then see how this time series, like in a, in a chemical reactor, how the temperature is related to the uh, the cool the the the, the um, reactor temperature is related to the cooler temperature, and whether there is a behavior um, that always looks similar at. Um, um, over time, yeah. For example, if there is a shift change, you can see, oh, wow, well, always when we have this shift change, this pattern occurs in the time series. Um, so, what I can see that the data scientists even use these self service tools to visualize the data, to explore the data, to get a feeling where they then can apply their uh, machine learning algorithms. And then, based on the feeling they get, they can also choose which machine learning algorithm is best suited. So, I think where you start is with the visualization. And then just looking at the time series is most of the, in most of the cases, not sufficient. So the contextual data yeah, in, your, um, in your planning systems or in your ERP systems, yeah, in, 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 in other like, like shift logbooks, yeah, that's important information. That's why Trend Miner also provides a thing called Context Hub, where you then bring in contextual information and correlate this with your time series. That's why we also have this integration so tightly um, integrated with Cumulosity that you can enrich your device data with other contextual data that sits in a CRM system or in a ERP system or, or somewhere. You know? Because you need to bring that data together to really get high qualitative insights for decision making. And the next one, um, one of our biggest obstacles to teacher is funding. How can we justify the funding to senior management? Yeah, that's basically the part that I mentioned in the beginning. You have to digitalize or you won't be competitive in the future. This is not really an option. And um, I think what I would do is I would argue this way with the senior management and maybe give some examples from companies that, that failed to <laughs> innovate and failed or, or were too late on the digitization route. Yeah? Take Kodak, for example. Yeah? Um, they are now out of business. And there are other examples as well. Um, and, and maybe also paint a, a, a very dark picture to, to, to make your senior management aware that it's time to act and the time is now. Yeah? If you wait another two or three years, it's too late. And you can get started, as I said, with relatively small use cases. So maybe pick a good use case and we can help you to find the right one if you need. Um, and prove value quickly so that the investment, that the return on investment is really clear and the value is also clear to your senior management. And then you can build it step by step and, and grow that digitalization initiative. Uh, the next question. What are the most common quality challenges that you see with your customers? Um, and how have they solved them? Most of the customers are not software companies. Yeah? And um, <laughs> the challenges are around testing, staging, how, you, how, can, how they can adopt to these, these very fast release cycles. Yeah? Cumulosity, we're shipping a major release every quarter. Yeah. But that also means if you want to stay up to date and benefits from the latest fixes and the latest new features, you need to also come into this continuous um, um, improvement, continuous delivery mode. Yeah? And, and um, that's a big change for the customers, yeah? that they can really pick a new software, get this automatically tested yeah, with all their apps, and then release their new apps to their customers. That's a, that's a really... Um, 
challenging thing that they have the staging in place, that they have a, um, a test environment, a, 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 a pre-production environment for quality testing, and then the production environment that needs to run rock solid 24 seven, yeah? And that then these, that the CI, CD pipeline, how's it called, this continuous integration, continuous development, that this is really implemented uh, across these staging environments. Um, that's something many customers have to, to set up and we are happy to help them because this ensures that the quality then in the production is the right quality they expect, for example, in manufacturing requirements. We sometimes really see a very pragmatic attitude. Oh, there's a new software. We install an update into our production and then boom, something goes wrong and everyone's looking uh, like, oh, how could that happen? Yeah. So this CI, CD pipeline and the staging environments, that's something we, we see quite often. And it has to do with software and how to work and uh, yeah, apply modern software principles. Next question. Uh, oh, that's, that's Jerry coming back to the bad players. Uh, he says the aim is trust and means methods and procedures for finding and disintermediating those actors who undermine community trust. I look for this in governance documents and record of actions. Perhaps you have an example. Um, this is, I I'm still might not get it fully, Jerry, sorry. Um, I think that's more in, the, in an ecosystem where you have a, a, a partner, a supplier, or a, um, yeah, someone in an ecosystem that's um, misusing some, some, some methods and procedures um, and, and undermining the, the, let's say, the reputation of the, of the ecosystem. Is it going in that direction? Um, I think we have to give you some examples. Um, Adamos, for example, they have clear guidelines on, on what partners, like also enabling partners and, and machine builders can do and shouldn't do yeah, in terms of development, right? So what's allowed and what's not allowed. Um, technically, we can also limit that to some extent, but there is also um, um, yeah, a certain code of conduct, what should be done and what should not be done. Um, but that might be specific to the middle stand because they know each other and uh, certain things are appreciated and others are not. Um, maybe follow up with me on an, on an, on an email or on a call. I, I need to still better understand the question and then maybe I can point you in the right direction. Another question here from Kelman. One of the biggest challenges and complexity is related to the edge data filtering analytics. How are you looking to the edge? Yeah, that's a very good question. And we support distributed architectures, right? So we have a Cumulosity IoT Edge, which is exactly designed for that. Um, and actually, we have two flavors. We have a thick edge, which is a, a single node virtual machine of Cumulosity IoT with the full thing in there with the operational store, the analytics, the device management that you can simply deploy on an edge server, for example, from Dell. We even offer that as an appliance together or on, a, on an industry PC. And you can use Cumulosity like use it in the cloud, but it's just on the edge on this limited hardware. And then for more hardware constrained devices, you know, so less powerful gateways, for example, we offer a thin edge. That's a more modular framework that provides you basic connectivity and device management options. And then you can, depending on your needs, install additional modules like a streaming analytics, which has only a small footprint, but you don't have the, um, yeah, the fully fledged Cumulosity IoT for the thin edge, yeah? And then this thin edge establishes a connection to the cloud. So the thin edge can't run standalone. It just connects to, to the centers, maybe has an Apama um, at the thin edge, which is our streaming analytics. And this exactly does the filtering analytics there. And then only the relevant data or the pre aggregated data sent to the cloud. Any further questions? I think that looks like you just got to the last one and the okay. timing was excellent because I think we're just a few minutes past four o'clock. Mm -hmm. um, so we managed to get everything done um, almost inside the 60 minutes. So um, Jürgen, just going back to the point you mentioned with Jerry, if there are any further questions, um, I would be happy to facilitate any introductions on email um, if people want to connect with you directly. Um, we will also upload the recording of this session into the industry IoT platform. Um, a few people have already emailed us to ask us for the recording, um, which is great. So myself and the team will send out some more information to the participants on how you can download um, the recording. 
Um, Jürgen and Murat, I will um, onboard you guys into our community as well so you can continue the discussions um, with the participants via our platform. Um, but apart from that, thank you very much for your time this afternoon. Um, it was a great presentation, very well delivered. Um, and it was a pleasure to have you guys on there today. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, we look forward to hearing from, from you and all the participants in that call. So thanks again for your interest and, and goodbye. Thank you very much, guys. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.